we have been told as parents, I also have three, my three are all grown now, but um, we've been told to make time for reading and have a bedtime reading routine. I come from a field of supporting families who have students with learning difficulties. And with that, I think that if bedtime routine works for you, that's great. Absolutely encourage reading before bed. But if morning routine works better for you, then absolutely do it then. Um, it also means to, to find time even on those times when you're outside of a regular schedule, if you're off on vacation or if you're away for a period of time, to make sure that you make that time. And it could also be that you're making time to read with your child and read to your child and read to allow your child to be engaging with print as well. It, it's also important for them to see you reading. It doesn't have to be always you fostering them to read. It can be you reading side by side. They see that you're also engaging in print. And whether that be newspapers, books, novels, research, whatever it is that, that you um, are happy reading, make sure that your kids see you interacting with print as well. So, so that's the first thing. Just be there and support and encourage and model um, and, and let them uh, really engage in print. So let's go on to the next one, Rachel thinking about um, dyslexia. So again, th this is the field that I'm coming in from is that dyslexia presents its own unique set of difficulties. And, and reading disabilities generally affect quite a lot of our population. A lot of folks don't realize that it's somewhere between say six and 17% of the population. There's a, a common term used regularly that says one in five are affected by dyslexia to some degree. So dyslexia really runs on a continuum. So it can be very mild um, and it only cause minimal difficulties in the acquisition of reading, or it can be quite moderate or very, very severe. And of course, the mild cases of dyslexia are more prevalent. The very severe uh, cases of dyslexia are less common. So that's why you have a big range in your percentages of students with dyslexia. So there, there's lots of estimates out there, but dyslexia is a reading difficulty and it's a neurological condition. So what's happening is the brain is wired to not process reading as effortlessly as it would be processed for those without dyslexia or reading disorder. So it's a wiring difficulty and it doesn't mean that they can't learn to read. It means that our students with dyslexia need something special in order to be able to develop that skill. Um, so just on the next slide, I, I want to talk briefly about what comprehension is. And, and this is quite important because comprehension is kind of the holy grail, that understanding what they read is going to support that joy of reading. So when we're, when we're talking about reading, we want students who are reading to read quickly, and fairly effortlessly and fairly fluently so it sounds like natural speech. That's how reading should sound to them. And if all of those pieces are in place, then your, your child is most likely understanding what they read or comprehending what they read. And there are ways to measure if your child is reading fluently as to the expectation for their age or their grade. There's ways of doing that. But one of the easiest ways for a parent to recognize if their child is most likely reading fluently is, is are they understanding what they read? And are they reading and it sounds fairly effortless? So when you're picking books at home, you should have books that your, your child is not making a lot of errors when they are reading independently. So when they are looking at um, words on the page, your child should be able to figure out what those words are. And if they can can't, then that book is probably too hard. Now, when a book is too hard, it doesn't mean that you should avoid it. It doesn't mean that you don't read it. It means that it probably is something that you're going to support in a different way as a parent. So if the book is um, causing your child to stumble over more than say one out of every 10 words or one out of even every five words, that your, your percentage, your goal of accuracy should be about 95% accurate. Um, so if your child is struggling with more than every one of every five or 10 words, then it means that you need to help them with that. So in order for your child to be engaging, you're going to be supporting them with that. And that might mean if your child is dyslexic, it might mean you're going to give them the word or you're going to help them chunk the word down. Um, but 
that you, you want to be able to help them to engage in that so that they can understand what they've read. And one of the other strategies that I suggest to parents is that if your child is reading a book and they get stuck on a word and you realize, okay, they've chosen this book and it's probably beyond their reading level, but they really want to read it. So you want to help them with it. And you might give them the part of the word and the child goes on and finishes the sentence. Go ahead and have them reread that sentence again. Just make sure that they can pull it all together. And hopefully from there, there, they'll get meaning, they'll get comprehension and understanding what they've just read. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Um, of course, difficulties mean that if your child doesn't understand what they've read, if they're, if they're not comprehending the book or passage or paragraph or story or, or whatever it is they're interacting with, they are likely reading with less fluency, which means when they're reading, it might sound kind of um, stuck, it might sound jagged, it might sound not like natural speech. And when they lack fluency, they're usually not motivated to read. When they're not motivated to read, they read less. When your child reads less, it results in smaller opportunity to continue acquiring new vocabulary and just less exposure to reading, less exposure to practicing that fluent speech, which again contributes to lack of comprehension. And this is a vicious cycle. Unfortunately, it's a vicious cycle. So, um, you know, we, we want to be aware of that. Our goal is that they are reading and understanding. I just want to go into the next uh, page and spend just a couple of minutes here. There, there's lots of different kinds of books that we can use with our kids. And we know right from when your child is in utero or when they first come to you, there's a lot of books that you might be starting them with that are wordless books or picture books, and, and they are engaging perhaps a story in a visual context. Sometimes you can create the story around it. There's a place for those books. Um, predictable text tends to come in more when children start to um, approach preschool and even kindergarten. Predictable text means that it's a story where you have a sentence that might start out the same and just parts of the sentence change. The idea behind these books is hopefully the children will get the rhythm of those parts of the sentence and be more likely able to um, figure out the rest of the words in the sentence. Um, those books are also usually heavily picture-based. Um, then we get into a couple of other areas. One of them is a decodable book or a phonic book, and then a controlled decodable. And I've got this highlighted because I think this is an important thing for parents to understand. Because a decodable book or a phonics-based book if someone just says it's a phonics book, then some parents might think, okay, well, this should mean that my child should be able to sound it out. The difficulty with a lot of phonics books is that they might have words in them that are decodable or words that you can break down and you should be able to sound out. The problem is if it's not controlled, and I'll talk about that later, it uses um, vocabulary that has sounds in it that are not regular or commonly used sounds. There are much higher level uh, kind of sound in which the child is probably not yet acquired. So I've got a couple of examples here. There's a, a, a series, and, and I'm, I'm not picking on any series at all. I just grabbed a few just to give folks examples. There's a place for this, um, but I'll, I'll tell you about that place in a minute. So here's an example of a phonics book, okay? So this phonics book says, Anteater's Mystery Vacation. And it is a very cartoon-based um, imagery all throughout the story. Uh, and, and it's an I can read book, so it says that it's phonics. And a lot of parents who don't understand what that might mean thinks, okay, it's an I can read book, it's an early level book. But if I look at even just the title, Title, Ant Eaters, the kind of phonics that is necessary in order for the child to be able to decode this book, the word ant has AU in it. That's quite a high level vowel team that a lot of little kids are not going to be able to decode. 
eaters is a two syllable word that's much more complex. It has a vowel team in the first syllable and it has what's called an R controlled vowel in the second syllable, also pretty high level. Then we get the word mystery, which is a very exciting word, but it has two uses of the letter Y, neither of which are consonants. So they're not saying Y in any case, they're saying two different kinds of vowel sounds pretty complex. The first vowel sound is even a Greek vowel sound, so it's very complex. So just thinking about even the words in the title, it, it the, the book itself is actually quite complex and would be very difficult to decode. Whereas if I take a book that is perhaps a controlled decodable, and I've got a couple of examples here. There's one here called The Lost Dog. One of the things parents can look for with a controlled decodable or um, a, a book that really is geared to those students, just those little learners that are just starting to acquire the ability to read, is that a lot of these books will show the level of difficulty or the kinds of content that is included within the story. So somewhere in the story, it will tell you the concepts that they're focusing on. So this one here right on the inside says that these are short vowel O's and it's and it's short vowels specifically and uh, really focused on short vowel O's. So I know picking up um, a book like this, I can even look at the back of the book and it tells me which consonant sounds are included within the book and which vowel sounds that would have been acquired uh, before this one. So this one's working on short vowel O with the assumption that the children have also really mastered short vowel A, A and short vowel I, I. This is a control decodable. This is the kind of book that a parent can go, okay, does my child know how to read those sounds? And if they do, they're probably gonna be able to get this. And, and not all the books that are controlled decodable are little plain uh, paperback books. Some of them are quite lovely. Um, uh, I'm just gonna show another paperback book because these Bob books are almost everywhere. They're really accessible for families. But um, here's another example of a really great controlled decodable. Okay, so this one here is by Flyleaf Publishing. Um, and I, I, uh, I gain nothing by telling you how much I love Flyleaf Publishing, but I do, I love them a lot. They're pretty great books. So Flyleaf, this one is called Frank the Fish Gets His Wish. All these books are controlled decodables. And even on the spine of the book, it will tell you the skills that this particular book will be focusing on when the child is reading. So this one is focusing on SH and I'll be able to look inside the book and see the other sounds that are expected to be able to read in order for the child to be able to read this book effectively. Because what we know from teaching our children to read is that the most effective strategy for a child learning to read is to actually understand the association between letters and the sounds those letters would make. And oftentimes parents are um, told that the English language is very irregular and there's lots of exceptions to rules and so many rules and words that break the rules and all the sight words and it, you know, that is an unfortunate untruth. It is not accurate. Most of the English language is actually completely regular. There's only about 4% of our language that is irregular. And for that 4% of the language, of course, we have to teach those sounds differently. But the rest of our language is actually quite regular. The trick is we have to teach it in a way that makes sense. And for typical learners, for, for kids without reading difficulties, they'll probably be able to guess and acquire many of those letter sound relationships fairly effortlessly. But for our students with dyslexia, they need direct teaching and we shouldn't be skipping ahead and just assuming that they'll acquire some sounds effortlessly because that's not how they're wired. Our dyslexic students are bright. They have average to above average IQ, but they need direct instruction. And it should come from someone who understands the code of the language. And hopefully they have people around them that will do that. So you wanna choose books that support the reading level that they have acquired and give them practice so they can build fluency, actually decoding words that they can read. Um, many of the other books that I've mentioned there, like high frequency books, those are books that, that focus on high frequency vocabulary. A lot of um, 
reading programs that are available in schools focus on high frequency words. And a lot of them also have predictive text, but they focus on high frequency. But here's something that I really want people to take away. I really want parents to take this away. Um, there are many strategies for actually teaching a child to read. The most effective way to teach a child to read is to actually teach them the letter sound correspondences and actually teach them that when you're reading a word in English, you read from left to right, you say the sounds and hopefully they've acquired the sounds to be able to decode those words. And then you pull the sounds together and blend them together and then you continue reading. It is not an effective strategy to have them look away from the word. And unfortunately, there's a lot of programs that are high frequency vocabulary based programs or predictive text programs or even high low, which means high interest, low vocabulary. Uh, there's a lot of programs like that out there, unfortunately, that are um, distributed in schools that tell the child if you don't know the word to look at the picture or if you don't know the word to um, guess from the text or guess from the context or just to skip over it. All all of those are not effective, not effective uh, strategies for learning to read. For actually learning to read, you want your kids to be engaging with print that they can engage with. So, so it brings me to the last two. The last two kinds of content that I wanted to talk about, the first is graphic novels. There is absolutely a place for graphic novels. Remember when I was talking about having your child just engage and, and hopefully they're gonna get the joy of reading. You want your kids to actually like the process of reading. And if you have a little guy who picks up a graphic novel and perhaps it isn't you know something that you think appeals or has a very deep story, if he, if he or she engages in that graphic novel and enjoys it, there is a place for that. You want them to have that joy of reading. So absolutely foster that. And, and the other one is about audiobooks. There is an absolute place for audiobooks. Audiobooks provide an opportunity for a child to be listening to a story or to a passage. And hopefully they're able to understand that passage and have that modeling of effective fluency um, given to them. The other piece with audiobooks that's <clears throat> pardon me, that's fantastic, is that audiobooks allow for a child to engage in a book that they perhaps are not able to read independently. So maybe it's a book at their school that the kids have been assigned to read as a class or as a group, or maybe it's a social thing where you've got some kids who are starting to read different books and they're talking about it socially. Hopefully they're talking about their reading socially on the playground or when they're hanging out or with their friends. And you want your child, particularly the child who struggles with reading or the child with dyslexia, whether they're diagnosed or not, to be able to engage in that conversation. Our kids are bright. They can understand. So absolutely engage in audiobooks so that your child can really understand the story and engage in the conversation and, and talk about those big ideas uh, that were um, demonstrated throughout the story. So there's a, a little something about audiobooks and, and uh, some different kinds of books. And you will be getting a handout. Um, I think, Christine, uh, there'll be a handout available to all of you to download afterward. And it's just a list of a few uh, publishers who provide hard copy of decodable readers, <clears throat> pardon me, decodable books, and then some other books that you might want to access that are books that are written from, uh, written by a person with dyslexia or written about a person with dyslexia. And then the other group in there are some just resource books for parents and for teachers um, about dyslexia and learning difficulties or reading disorders. Um, so I think that's it. If anyone has questions about that later, I'm happy to answer that. Um, and just Rachel, I think our last one here our last slide is just read to them, read with them, uh, make the time and allow for the opportunity. And if your child is reading for pleasure and they get stuck on a word, give them the word, tell them what that word is. If you think it's something that they can't sound out, give it to them so that they continue to read fluently and then let them reread that sentence again. 
<clears throat> and if your child can decode that word, if they can sound it out, if you think that's within their ability, then go ahead and um, let them do that. And then again, have them try and synthesize that sentence again at the end. So really making sure that they're pulling it together and they get meaning from it. it it's okay to do that. It's okay to give them the word. We want them to enjoy the process. Okay. And I think, I think that's it for me. Um, if you find a lot of common error patterns, be sure to let your school know. Be sure to let your, um, your support providers know. If you hear error patterns with your child, for instance, if you are commonly providing a certain word and it's a little tricky word and maybe your child is reading it differently on a variety of subsequent pages, you know, that might be something that you might want to hang on to. If you are being given leveled books to use at home that are part of a school-based uh, leveled reading program, and you find your child is really, really struggling with those, let your teachers know. Um, sometimes your teachers are able to help and sometimes um, they're not able to help if that's not the expertise that they have. So reach out to someone who can help guide you as to the appropriate reading level for your child, okay? And I think that's it for me, Rachel. So I will uh, just take a pause for a second and we'll see if there are any questions. I think there's one question. There is one question. You'll probably get to this, Rachel, as, as you go along. But the question is, I'm looking for books for a teenage dyslexic, 15 years old. Do you have recommendations where and how to look? Yes, definitely. Um, so I was going to focus a little more on kids um, services and kids uh, collections, but definitely uh, some of the programs I'm going to mention have categories for teenagers as well. Um, but I'll try and keep that in mind and speak to teens as well for their reading needs. Very good. So um, I'm going to tell you about CELA and CELA is the Centre for Equitable Library Access. And we are an organization that provides books in accessible formats to people with uh, print disabilities. And so the definition of print disabilities is a learning disability like dyslexia, a physical disability like um, let's say cerebral palsy, where someone may not be able to hold the book or turn the pages of the book, and also vision loss. So our collection um, is built on those, um, is built through public libraries so that you would need a public library card to uh, access our collection. Uh, this is the case in most provinces. If you live though in BC or in Manitoba, uh, it's only some libraries offer CELA. So I would encourage you to go to our site and um, check the list of libraries to sign up. If you do live, though, in Manitoba or BC, no worries, you can access CELA, but you would only have access to our electronic resources, which I imagine for this audience is mostly what you're looking for, so you would be okay, but I did want to mention that. So we do have a collection of e-books, so we have e-audio books, we have e-text, and we also have Braille, obviously, for those with vision loss. There we go. So just to tell you a bit about our collection. Um, so our collection actually includes both uh, Sela's collection, but also another collection called Bookshare, which some of you may already be familiar with. And Bookshare is a collection from the US and it's a very large collection of books in digital formats for people with print disabilities. So same formats essentially as Sela offers. So audiobooks, e-text and um, uh, braille. Uh, they also include uh, books in formats such as EPUB, which I'll talk about later, and also in Word. So again, we'll talk about that later. But our combined collection, if you have a CELA membership, is uh, 800,000 titles and growing. It grows almost daily. So I'm pleased to say there's lots and lots of content for people of all ages. So we do have books for kids and right from babies, very early books, all the way through to young adults and then, of course, adults as well. 
Our collection is bilingual. Uh, however, with our Bookshare collection, we do have more and more books in uh, other languages as well. But we do have a large French collection, if that's of interest to you. So we also have magazines include, and those are e-text magazines, um, or you can use our newspapers, which are also e-text format. And I thought I'd mention newspapers uh, just in case uh, there were uh, parents of teens or even for re projects at almost any level, they could be handy to have access to the newspapers. And the newspapers uh, cover a national coverage like the Global Mail, we have that one, but also the major regional papers and local newspapers as well. So our books are made in a format called DAISY. And DAISY, spelled just like a flower, um, is actually an international standard developed for accessible publishing. And what a DAISY book means is that if you use a DAISY reading app or a DAISY reading player, you can move to specific parts of the book, uh, just like you could if you were flipping through a print book. So you could go look at the table of contents, go right to chapter three, and start reading. So um, the DAISY standard actually equalizes print reading and audiobook reading. It also can be used with e-text. So I might mention the word DAISY throughout uh, the presentation. What I mean are the types of books that CELA offers in DAISY formats. So before I talk about how you access our books and uh, more about the actual titles themselves, I did want to mention that uh, on CELA's site, we do have tutorials on how to access our books. We also have some videos and we also have a call center, a bilingual call center. So if you were to sign up your child for CELA, uh, you could call or email our contact center if you had a question about uh, accessing a book or wanted to order books. So just to let you know about that, and I have uh, the opening hours on our site, on the, sorry, on the slides, which is 8 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Times. But we do cover all time zones for sure. So now we get to talk about sort of the most exciting part of, of the presentation, which are the actual books. So the reason we called the slide Beyond Baby Books is we wanted to let you know that CELA has an enormous collection of sort of early reader chapter books and then higher. But we also have books that are for younger kids as well in case you'd like to still enjoy those books with your child. So uh, we do have popular chapter books and we also have popular series. So we do have Wonder, for example, which a lot of classes are studying. We do have Harry Potter, all of them, all different formats. So no worries, you're covered there. But then in terms of series, we do have popular series like Captain Underpants uh, and those sort of graphic novel series. And we, we always want to make sure that we have those books so that kids can read what uh, other kids are reading so no one feels left out. And really, that's kind of the, the purpose of CELA is to make sure that everyone has equal access to the titles they need, regardless of the format of their, that they need to read in. So just to let you know that's that's kind of what we are and what's our mission. We do have books that uh, are nonfiction books, but this is where it's important that I let you know that we do not have textbooks, so school textbooks. You may find a few textbooks in Bookshare's collection. So if you were to search our catalog, you actually would get results from both CELA's collection and Bookshare's collection. And you can filter those out as well, depending on what you need. But we do not have textbooks. So if you need a textbook, you should go to your school or provincial resource center, however it works for you in your area. Uh, just going back to nonfiction, we do definitely have titles that could help with homework support. Uh, so books about different subjects, uh, but then we also have kind of the fun nonfiction books like those not, uh, National Geographic books, for example, the um, Weird But True series. Uh, I know those are very popular. So if you want something fun to read, we do have those in our collection and you'd get them in different formats as well. I did want to mention also that the way we build our collection is we do actually make our own accessible books, but we also um, 
get the titles from looking at different reading programs. So for kids, I wanted to let you know, we do have partnerships with the big reading programs in Canada. So those include the TD Summer Reading Club, the Ontario Library Association's Forest of Reading program. And I know that the lists have just been announced. So we, are, uh, we will be making uh, the minimum a number of books so that kids can participate in a particular category and vote for the book of their choice. Again, it's all to make that equal opportunity in terms of reading, but also reading programs as well. Uh, we also, for those on the East Coast, uh, we do have support the Hackmatack reading program as well. Uh, and we also support summer reading programs like TDSRC, the TD Summer Reading Club. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the books that are mentioned uh, on the slide or I showing, I'm showing the covers. So uh, the first one is Dear Sweet Pea. So again, you could have it e-text, audio, whatever format you need. And this one is about, uh, so it's for middle school readers and it's for, it's about um, a kid going through a divorce. So something to, it's a, it's, if you need a book for, for a homework perhaps or an English kind of lesson, that would be a good book. Camp Average is a fun book, but it's also, it's about a, a boy who's very competitive. So if you're thinking of maybe something for the future for summer reading, that might be a good one to, to pick. And um, I put uh, the, one of the rainbow um, uh, fairy books on uh, the slide here. Again, just to show we do have those popular books. Those are books you've probably seen in bookstores, perhaps in your school library, but we do have those books as well. So anyone can enjoy them. And then the last picture is a book, uh, sorry, it's not a book, it's a magazine called Muse. So the magazines in our collection are mostly educational based. So Muse is one of them. Um, Ladybug is another one for very, very young kids. Uh, unfortunately, just the, the provider of the magazines we, we use um, does not include magazines like Owl or Chickadee, those popular Canadian books, uh, magazines right now. So. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that's what we have, just some very sample books for you to consider, uh, and I would encourage you to go to our website and uh, explore the books there. So to register for SELA, the, it's important to note that the person with the account is the person with the, with the print disability. So it'd be the child that you would sign up in your case. So if your child has dyslexia, they would be the ones to, to need an account. And so they would need a public library card and then they would fill out our uh, registration form and the link to it is on the slide here. You can also go to your public library and sign up as well, but um, you certainly can do it on your own if you already have a public library card. Uh, so when you sign up for SELA, you do not need to provide proof of disability. However, if you'd also like to access Bookshare titles, you do need to complete an extra form and we call it the proof of disability form. Uh, you will need someone to sign it though who can authorize that your child has a print disability therefore needs access to books in accessible formats. So there you can ask a special education teacher, you could ask your doctor, there, there are many validating um, authorities that can do that for you but it is an extra step uh, and it is required but again that's only to access Bookshare books, you can access SELA books without requiring proof of disability. The one point I would make when you are signing up your child is there is a space in the form to add a designate. So I would strongly encourage that you add your own name as the parent's child. It could be a teacher though, it could be a grandparent, it could be anybody, but we do recommend having an adult um, sign up, sign through the form as being the designate, just support, to support the child. Also, we send out um, a monthly newsletter, so and that will give uh, service updates, more title recommendations. So again, it's, it's great if, if we can have an adult as part of the account. It's not necessary though, but highly recommended. In addition to the actual person with the disability getting access to SELA, we do give access to the educators and other professionals who support them. So the, uh, the registration process would be, uh, so if a teacher wanted to sign up, then they could get a public library card and fill out our educa educator access program form. Uh, 
And if it's a professional, same thing, they need a car library card and fill out our registration form. I thought it would be helpful on the slide to list the different types of occupations and what program they fit under. So basically educator access is for um, more the education edu uh, faculty, uh, whoever in an institution, whereas client access support tends to be more the other professionals, like an occupational therapist, for example. So just to give you a note about that, again, uh, we do encourage you to tell your teacher about our program. That way they can get an account and then support any of their students with print disabilities. And these are lifelong memberships too, so they can go on and, um, and use them for any student, even if it's 10 years from now, they're welcome to do so. So in terms of how you would read books from Sila's collection, so I'm first going to talk about doing it on a tablet or a phone. So basically these mobile electronic devices, which I think for this audience uh, probably is the way you mostly would want to read these books, our books. So there are two apps that we recommend. Uh, so the first one is called Easy Reader and it's made by a company called Dolphin. And Easy Reader functions as a, an ebook reader and it has synchronous audio and e-text at the same time. So what that means is as it's reading at the book aloud, you have the highlighting that's following along with the text. So it's that visual component and auditory component at the same time. Uh, so also with um, the Easy Reader um, and also Voice Dream, which is another app we recommend, you can get those on both iOS and on Android devices. I will say for Voice Dream Reader, uh, you do have to pay for it. And it's a little, it's about $20 US. It's a very good reader, but Easy Reader works as well. So we, this is the one that we tend to recommend. And we definitely have tutorials on our site on how to, on how to use Easy Reader. So I just want to quickly talk about the images on the slide. So the first image where it says book information, this is just kind of a landing page for the book. So it's a screenshot from the app. I think it's from an iPhone. And the, so it will give you the title, author, obviously, and a description of the book so that you'll know what the book is about. The other uh, screenshot comes from uh, an Android phone, and this is the actual book and the options to be able to manipulate the book and move forward in the book or in any direction. So just very quickly at the top where you'll see the letter A, uh, that allows you to adjust the text size, text uh, spacing as well, letter spacing. So it's a very versatile app. And next to the A at the top, there's a little speaker symbol. Again, you can uh, increase the speed of the voice, slow down the voice. Uh, and on an iPhone, you can choose which voice you'd like to have read aloud. So one point to make that these are synthetic voices. I, they're pretty good, um, but just to, to let you know, for some of Sila's books, it will be synthetic voice that you're reading, especially if it's a Bookshare book. If you access a book from Sila's collection, you could have a human narrated book, which tends to be more pleasant to listen to. But just so you know, very quickly, those are how uh, the, the Re Easy Reader app works and some screenshots. At the bottom of that screenshot, the where is the whale, um, there are the player functions so that you can stop, pause, move ahead. Um, and then uh, at the bottom left-hand corner are these uh, sort of lines on top of each other, and that would bring up the chapter list. So just one last note on this slide is the whale watching from space is actually a screenshot I took from Muse magazine, the, one, the cover I just showed you in the previous slide or a few slides back. And this, um, so just to let you know, there's the highlighting as it goes along and it has images, which I think is interesting. So just they're kind of fun. And really the essence is to try and make uh, audiobook or e-text reading the same as visual reading with print. So I do want to mention reading books on a computer or a laptop. So really the best ways to do this are either through uh, picking the Word format or EPUB format when you're choosing which format you want to read. So, and by that I mean you go onto a CELA site and it will give you a drop-down menu of the different formats for the books you're looking for. 
So if you pick the EPUB format, you will have, uh, if you use Google Read and Write, for example, uh, that would be the best one to use there. And it's also good if you happen to use iBooks. Google Read and Write is obviously better because it has more accessibility functionality built into it. For Word, I did want to mention Word's immersive reader. Maybe some of you have used it. And so the screenshot at the bottom of uh, my slide there is just showing you the, um, the how to operate immersive reader in Word and then what it looks like in terms of the, the text. So you can change the text spacing, which is great. And it does also highlight as well. And it will highlight as it reads aloud, which is another function that you can do. And you can also space apart syllables using immersive reader. Um, I imagine there are different um, opinions on how well that works uh, and doesn't work, but that is a function in case you didn't know about it. I thought I'd mention it to you here. One note, sorry, about the uh, reading in Word or even in Easy Reader. I did mention there are um, images. So you actually can get a graphic novel like the Sisters uh, books by uh, Raina Telgemeier uh, in Word. So those are fun, but they are a little bit clunky to read. So it might be better to use the tablet version or uh, an, a cell phone version. But I did want to mention reading on a computer just in case that was something of interest to all of you. So I wanted to make sure that I gave a bit of a plug for public libraries because most people have a public la library in their area. And I wanted to let you know that most public libraries do have eBooks that might be uh, accessible for your kids. So uh, most public libraries do have e-book and e-audiobook collections. So some of the most popular ones are Overdrive, for example. Um, I did some research and asked some libraries what types of books they offer to people with dyslexia. And some libraries do offer decodable uh, books, decodable readers, which is great. Some offer books in dyslexic font. For some people that might work and others it's not so great, but it is an option that some public libraries offer. And also libraries often have accessible, uh, uh, accessible technology stations. So a computer set aside with accessible technology on it. And that includes uh, uh, devices like a Kurzweil scanner. So again, something just to be aware of in terms of how public libraries are supporting their patrons. I just, I'm showing a screenshot of, um, uh, this is a catalog entry from Red Deer Public Library in Alberta. And they actually have a, uh, they call it a dyslexia backpack. And that includes a whole bunch of items. It's like a kit to uh, support readers with dyslexia and their families. So they have books in there, they have activity sheets, um, and they actually have a sheet for parents about the signs of dyslexia. So I thought I'd mention that and really just encourage you to, uh, to ask your library what resources they have for your kids. So we're actually getting towards the end uh, of the presentation. So we'll have some questions, take questions very soon. But I did want to let you know of some resources to find books. So um, Corey has mentioned that uh, we'll be providing a list of publishers who uh, create decodable books. Uh, if you want to join SELA, then uh, we have several pages that will help you find book selections. So we have a whole section just for uh, titles for kids and teens. We also have a special category for teens and kids on our new titles page. And then we just launched a kids and teen uh, book award page as well. So things to help you, resources to help you. Uh, just in general, there are many, many resources for helping you find uh, recommendations for reading for your kids, but some notable ones are the Canadian Children's Book Center and reading programs like the Forest of Reading and other provincial reading programs. I highlighted Forest of Reading just because it's going on right now and I thought that might be of particular interest. Uh, there are also resources fitting in with uh, making sure kids reading inclusive titles and diverse titles. So Good Minds is a website to find um, sort of filtered Indigenous titles. Someone has gone through and vetted that list. Uh, 
And also, uh, if you want kids uh, to, to read books, uh, sort of own voice stories about kids from diverse backgrounds, the FOLD Literary uh, Festival, so FOLD stands for the Festival of Literary Diversity, has its own kids program. And so if you follow them on Twitter, and I've put their Twitter handle on the site, they often recommend uh, kids books. So I thought that might be of interest to you as well. So we've come to the end of the presentation. So Christine, I think we'll open it up for questions now. Wonderful, thank you. And we have quite a few questions. So I think this first one is probably for Corey, um, but for parents who have dyslexia themselves, which is actually very common, um, as we know that dyslexia can be hereditary. So for a parent who has dyslexia themselves, how can they help their child at home? How can they support them to actually help them read, sound out the words and develop those skills needed? A great question. And, you know, everyone has, uh, when I talked about dyslexia runs on a continuum from mild to moderate to severe, um, it, it's going to depend on the parent's level of engagement with print as to how they can support their child through their development. But, you know, really providing the time would be very, very helpful. Um, making sure that you have carved out a period of time where you can also not only just share your own struggles and, and what you found difficult difficult um, when you were engaging with print as the parent would be sharing with the child, but also to um, be sure that you're helping and, and you can hear if a child is struggling with reading. So if you've been provided books that you're supposed to support your child reading at home and you can hear your child making more than say one in five words are, are um, misread or even one in 10 words uh, are misread, you know that that's going to be a little bit too difficult. If you as the parent are not able to read to that level yourself, go ahead and engage in audiobooks. Um, and there are many that uh, Rachel mentioned, but there are also programs that you will be able to find. Uh, Rachel had mentioned some books that you can read along with what is presented on the screen and words will be highlighted as you read along. So depending on the parent's level of being uh, of ability to read, um, support your child to the best of your ability, but then reach out for those extra supports to help you so that you can still engage in reading with your child. But I think it's, you know, it, it runs on a continuum and it's very specific. I know many adults with dyslexia who, um, who can read proficiently, who are expert readers. I know those who hold PhDs and are researchers that, that also uh, struggled with dyslexia and it affected the most when they were learning to read. And now as an adult, they have to read more carefully. Maybe they read more slowly but they can read. I also know adults who can barely read. Uh, they can only read just passably and they avoid it at all costs. Don't avoid it. If you're supporting with your child, go ahead and engage in a way that you can still support your child. And I do know adults with dyslexia who are complete non-readers as well. So depending on your level as a parent, um, you know, try and find a way in which you can still support the child either by providing the time or the encouragement or the accommodations and access to technology to support them through or services, you know, some asking the school to help uh, support with services or even services available in your community. Thank you. And perhaps this one for Rachel. Um, once a book has been checked out, is it accessible any other place? Are there a limit, I guess, to how many um, available versions there are on CELA? No. Um, so if you borrow a copy and then your neighbor borrows a copy, it doesn't matter. It's one copy per person. And actually, uh, because of our agreement with Bookshare and Bookshare is in the States, um, the books are fingerprinted. So we know exactly who has each copy of the book, but there's no limit. Absolutely not. Um, and you can borrow many, many books. Um, so you can have up to 150 books over a 30 day rolling period. So there's lots of options there. And I also have one parent here who has asked if they can make suggestions to CELA um, for books that they would like to see. 
Yes, definitely. So on our homepage, we have a suggest a title link. And so you're welcome to suggest a title. And then what happens is we will consider it for our overall collection and see if it's a good fit. Uh, and then um, and then we would either accept it or, or um, maybe suggest you try your public library or other sources. Uh, just to let you know, um, so the way that we access our books is through creating them and creating a book in an accessible format uh, can take several months. So it, the, we definitely have a production lag time when we want to add books in our collection. We try as often as possible to get books that are already in accessible formats and we do that through exchange programs with different publishers um, and other other ways like that. So there is definitely a time consideration if you want a book. It's not instant by any means but um, we definitely encourage everyone to suggest titles. Uh, check our catalog first and if you don't find it then definitely suggest it and we'll, we'll look into it for you. Perfect. And after this one for Corey. Um, we were told by our classroom teacher that our children should be reading for 20 minutes every day, but my daughter gets tired after 10 minutes. How is how important is it to make her continue to read for the whole 20 minutes? Uh, that's another really good question. Usually minutes are, are designated according to the grade of the child. So there's a, a general guideline of 10 minutes per grade. So I'm guessing your child might be in grade two or so. And, and 20 minutes a day is, um, you know, certainly something that can be achieved. But if your child fatigues, maybe 10 minutes is happening in the morning and 10 minutes is happening at night or 10 minutes is happening when you're in the car or 10 minutes is happening when you're sitting on a bench waiting for everyone else at the end of your soccer game to finish packing up wherever the case may be. So you can take those minutes and divide them in different places. The other suggestion I have for you is that engagement and reading doesn't have to be totally born the child. So the child could read for about 10 minutes and then maybe you as the parent can take the next five or eight and then ask them to finish up again. So if your child really fatigues in reading, then um, that's another way that, that you could divide the time. Um, it's about that opportunity to engage in print. So um, try and do it as much as possible. And if the child is struggling, one of the things that I would suggest that is that if the child is really struggling to read, they're having trouble figuring out what a word says and reading it, it could be that what they're reading is too difficult. So you want the child to be able to read successfully. So there should be different um, uh, print available to them that they can read. Okay. And this is probably a question for both of you, and I don't know whether you'll be able to answer this off the top of your head, but let's see. Do you have any suggestions for books that deal with bullying and dyslexia? I do. I, there are a few, and the titles off the top of my head are not probably going to uh, come to the top of my head, but, but there are a few. Um, one of the places that I would suggest you check is the publications tab on the International Dyslexia Association. They have quite a few books that are available uh, to purchase through them that deal with um, uh, learning difficulties, and they're sort of picture-based books. Um, um, one of the ones that um, that is coming off the top of my head right now is called The Alphabet War. Um, and, and I'm not sure if that one is still available through IDA, but it's about a child's difficulty in dealing with the alphabet and how he was always uh, feeling at war with letters. Um, the other ones are, uh, there's a series of books um, where a child is dealing here, here's the title. It says, if you're so smart, how come you can't spell Mississippi? Um, and, and there's a series of books uh, under that title as well. I can't quite recall uh, any others off the top of my head, but those are a couple. So you, you will be able to find some, and you may be able to find some under the dyslexia, um, under a dyslexia search bar on just even under Amazon as well. Rachel, do you have anything to add? 
Uh, I was just going to add, so we have the Orca series of books. So those are for, slight, I mean, they have younger ones, but it's slightly older readers. And there's one, um, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's definitely about a kid with dyslexia and who's in special education oh, and his yeah. struggles with that. So we definitely have that one. Um, and um, I didn't, I just did a search. I didn't find anything specifically about dyslexia and bullying in our collection. But if you look at a public library collection, you usually can click on the subject subject headings and that will help you pull together a search. And another source is um, through your public library. They usually have a database called Novelist and Novelist is a reader advisory tool so that if you were to put in the search words dyslexia, bullying, and then you can each, even um, say what age level you'd like to limit it to, you'll probably get a nice list of, of titles there. So definitely are research, uh, resources out there. Thank you. We also add the Frank's, uh, the Hank Zipser series as well. Um, the Hank Zipser series is a, a story. Um, the character's name is Hank Zipser, and it's written by Henry Winkler. And mm -hmm. it is a, a novel, or there's a few now that are in the in the Hank Zipser series that are about a boy dealing with dyslexia, and and his engagement with friends is included within that story. So that's another one, the Hank Zipser series. And just a follow-up question, Corey, um, around the, the timing uh, for children to read is that 10 minutes of reading per grade, is that for any child or a child with dyslexia? You know, it tends to be that schools use that as a blanket guideline as to how much time children should be spending engaged in reading in younger grades or engaged in homework overall. Um, you know, the, the thing we know about dyslexia is because um, the individual with dyslexia, their brain is wired differently. So learning to read is not going to come as effortlessly as it will for kids who just feel like they magically acquire reading. And if anyone tells you that all kids will just learn to read, that is not the case. Our kids with dyslexia need direct instruction. And unfortunately, our kids with dyslexia have to work harder, which means they probably need to spend more time than that. So if you are thinking about how much time should be spent working on the scale of reading. If your child is behind in their reading development, if you say have a third, fourth, fifth grader who is still not yet reading comfortably, even those little short vowel words, you're probably going to need more help than that. And, and it might be time to enlist some professional support um, to really help them understand that engagement with letters and the sounds those letters make. So um, dif um, dyslexia is itself is a difficulty with understanding sounds which are called phonemes in our language and how to map those phonemes to the letters that we use so they might even need more than say 10 or 20 minutes uh, per grade um, and it really specialized help that said if your child is spending an hour a day with someone who is not specialized and it is just reading rereading and rereading that might not be useful time that might actually be time that is contributing to your child's frustration so make sure that the time is spelt is spent well um, actually targeting the skills that they need to work on so if it means that you're reading with the child and engaging on uh, in in books and you're reading too um, absolutely do that and they're not too too old once they hit sixth seventh eighth grade to read a story to them read novels together um, you know I remember reading with my kids even when they were in grades six seven eight where we would pick um, a novel to read together and take turns reading it. And my child with dyslexia would probably spend less time reading than my other two who were not um, dealing with dyslexia. But it, you know, you're, you're still going to support that reading process. Thank you. I see we have come to the end of our time today. And I just wanted to, before we close off, to note there are um, a few questions in the um, Q&A box around uh, if you have a struggling reader, how do you know if there is some sort of underlying issue? Could it be dyslexia or not? I would suggest for all of those parents and guardians who are, are questioning if there's an underlying issue, take a look at our website at dyslexiacanada.org or feel free to send a, a question my way at info, I-N-F-O, at dyslexiacanada.org and you can find that on our website but you'll find a lot of helpful information there around early signs um, of dyslexia 
a lot of information around the difference between screeners and assessments and when you really should be reaching out for more help. And we have um, some links and resources in how to find a professional to get that help that you might need. So with that, I would like to thank both Corey and Rachel for your time and providing all of this amazing information um, to all of our attendees across Canada. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. And to all of our attendees, thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to all of you joining our next educational session. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks, Rachel and Christine. Thank you. Thank you.